they now knew sort of how they were going to do this. The original modeling had almost been stumbled on through Bandler's creativity and ability to assimilate. So off they went down to visit the great man Ericsson. Whom was a master of advanced and multi-level communication. And the great thing about Ericsson is even if they wanted to know the answer to a question, if Ericsson, I was going to say never, but I'll say rarely, rarely answered a question directly. And in all of the times that Brinda went there, he only heard Ericsson answer one question directly. And Ericsson's intention in doing that was to evoke an altered state in the person who asked it, because the person who asked it wasn't expecting a straight answer. They was expecting an Ericksonian metaphor, which is the way Ericsson worked. So Ericsson was smart enough to realize that this guy was looking for a metaphor and he got a straight answer. And the consequence was he went straight into trance. <laughs> Very clever. But Eric, they picked up in their five visits to Ericsson, again, the whole model. They sat and bulked in a line for the whole night. They had already been, well, Specifically, John Grinder had an interest now in what's known as, a, he calls, a know-nothing state. John Grinder had also been interested in deep trance identification and what occurs when you access a deep trance in somebody else's experience. So they had access to these ideas. And then this is what they did with Ericsson. In these altered states, picked up so much and then go back to California and play with what they had picked up still with their filter suspended they suspended all well, as best you could all filters in this operation of a know nothing state to get it all now I've often wondered what the clients experienced in California when they went to see Bandler and Rinder, and they were sitting there talking like an old man. Now, um, after eight or nine months of visits and practice, I think they had 102 different distinctions. Then it was time to test. Then it was time to play. Once they put them all out there. They've now deployed it, they've started to code it dropped what they felt was unnecessary. So Ericsson used to sit like this. They would take this out. Is it necessary to sit like that? Ericsson had a long, gravelly life due to his tongue being paralyzed uh, after the second bout of polio. Is it necessary for Bandler and Brenda to store in this tone? chain work with the So they stopped talking like that and used their everyday voices. Do you think their everyday voices was as effective as the long, gravelly Ericsson style? They kept everything else present, dropped that voice. What do you think the consequence was? Didn't work. If they said, do we have to talk? like this forever. Now we know that everybody does Ericksonian hypnosis doesn't talk like this. But it's quite funny to do it in front of a group of people just because you can. <laughs> but when they went back to talking like this, what they realized was in this voice, Ericsson had to be super. Ericsson in a way of expressing unconscious. And it was a movement. All of a sudden, we have a pattern. 
called what? Analogical markers. So you could do it in your own voice. But mark out. Set apart for the own time. And that's how they played. And then they tested their work. Now on a practitioner course, depending on the course you take, Depends if your course layers those Ericsson patterns a little bit by a little bit throughout the day. Uh, throughout the course, rather. Depends where it looks at the Ericsson and uh, Milton, sorry, the Milton model and the meta model uh, as inverses. It just depends how it's layered and taught. Whether it's taught inductively or deductively. It doesn't take nine months to teach the Milton model. You know, a lot of courses that teach us in, in, as a, a day or at least two days training, it's not nine months. And that's the real test of a model. Can other people learn the patterning without access to the original model, which we can't have access to now anyway because Ericsson's now hypnotizing on another plane, is the way you want to look at it. Can you, through the model, get the same or similar results as the original model did? And I think the Milton model, as Bandle and Rinder produced it, as with all its syntactic operations, is such a dynamic model, and such a non-linear model, that nothing has ever captured Ericsson in quite the same way and there have been so many books written on Ericsson. Nothing captures Ericsson in quite the same way, it's just dynamic fashion, as those distinctions. And John Grinder said to me that had he, as a linguist, studied Ericsson, he'd have got maybe 15 of the patterns through a conscious elicitation, but he wouldn't have got the intonation the embedded commands in quite the same way, some of the phonological and scope ambiguity stuff, had he not got inside Ericsson in the way he did. That is modeling. So there you have it in these stories I've told you this morning that actually formed from the historical <laughs> descriptions. Um, of NLP, the model of modeling. All right, and here it is up here. So how are we going to do this? Number one, a model of excellence. Pearls, Satya, and Ericsson were excellent at what they did. You know, they were simply brilliant. They didn't, and you know, a good model of excellence is someone who, who not only can get, get the results, um, you know, they actually get the results at you know quite exceptional levels. Number two, this is the big part. This is the part that's missing in so many modeling courses and so many other forms of modeling. It's the unconscious assimilation. Bandler, through his imitation, had unconsciously assimilated Pearl. People who saw both of them, as I said earlier, thought Pearl's Bandler did a better job of Pearls than Pearls. He had unconsciously assimilated that pattern. Gilligan, uh, who, uh, who also comes here to, to work with us at the Academy, Stephen Gilligan, he was sort of the prototype for the Ericsson work. So he did a deep, deep trance identification after um, they come back to California and he you know, went around the university, actually he took it right out to, to the limit in a wheelchair for a number of weeks, just to see what it was like to be that man Ericsson. Um, so that is a real unconscious simulation of the pattern. The consistently deployed of the pattern, which is step three, is then once you've got it in you, practice it. And in doing so, it will begin to come to consciousness, conscious mind. But it's through constantly the practice, it's the deployment of the pattern that you get it in your system 
and you begin to understand it at quite a deep level. The next step is coding. Now you've got it there. This is where you do step back. You know, and from third, you do step back. And from third, you've now almost see yourself and whatever is present. And this is how you structure it so you can tell it to other people. So you're now modeling yourself to a certain extent where you've got the patterning there. You're in this objective position and here is now going to provide the code for it. And the language or the code of the Milton and Meta model that Babylon Grinder used was transformational grammar. Having said that, rapport came out of uh, these models as well. So that was a different code. Okay? That was a different code. Anchoring actually came out of Ericsson's work from recognizing that the tonal differences captured and stabilized a state. By changing my voice tone, I could capture and stabilize a state. That was the original source of that. And then now we can test that in other representational systems. Does it work kinesthetically? Then you have a code, which is a pro provision of steps to do this thing called anchoring. And it isn't a model unless others can learn it. So if others can learn it, it's a model. You've got it, package, put it out there, test it through teaching. And NLP has gone the distance on those modeling projects because you have all sorts of people now still teaching these models who are maybe 10 or 12 people away from the original source. They're trained by somebody who's trained by somebody who's trained from somebody who's trained from somebody. Trained from somebody. Um, and even now, many generations down, those models still stand. You know, and even people who sometimes then try and put other stuff in there, the model still stands. The modeling was so clean and precise. And that is why I do urge you all to get in contact with the closest contact point you can to any model. So you all have access to people like Gilligan. Um, to where actually, you know, who would you want to learn Ericksonian hypnosis from? The man who spent five years with Erickson? Or the man who spent five days on a course with somebody else? I know where I'd go. Gilligan was five years after the modeling of Ericsson with Ericsson. Who would you want to learn about representational systems from? Uh, the people who created that stuff in the early days? So I would, I would always say, get access to those original source points where you can. And for those of you who can't, get as close as you can. And here you are close because you get in this stuff as, you know, pretty close, okay? And that's modeling. 